Uh, willkommen in einem anderen North Regens video, or welcome to another exciting video, in this case part 31 of my figure gaming hobby series of videos. In this case, I'll be covering how to create a historical playing area using standard terrain building blocks, which I would expect most players would possess. This is a follow-on from my uh, realistic a playing area, area series or video and is more focused on creating a playing area which is sufficiently historically accurate to let you understand what the commanders had to contend with while using non-custom created terrain features. Before I drill down into how we should use or how we can use commonly available terrain, Let's look at custom terrain first and why I don't think that is a good long-term solution. Now, when I talk about custom terrain, I mean a terrain piece which has been specifically created to mimic the actual terrain on a battlefield. But it has very little value for any other type of game. Now, this can be a terrain piece or the whole playing area. Now what you see up here is the template, or my template, for the Battle of Marengo, based on the SPI board game. The large hill on the right is not correct. In reality there were four or five hills which occupied, occupied this place, and um, I suspect SPI decided to make this a single hill to ensure the Austrians could not use those hills to assist in defence against the French counterattack. In the SPI game, the biggest issue the designers had was the recreation of the French counterattack. The final result was that a special French counterattack rule had to be implemented and uh, the removal of any useful terrain for the Austrians to use, which uh, worked if the Austrians actually attacked as they did historically, but because of these special rules, they instead never went up into the open area. Uh, to be destroyed by the French and stayed on the left of the playing area safely behind their defences. This is a one issue when you start creating uh, special rules. There are always unintended consequences. What we see here is the template on the left and my custom terrain on the right. Now I have many different terrain systems but in this particular case I was using a 3 by 4 foot playing area tray with a standard road network in it, which is why it doesn't match up. On top of this I place specific custom terrain pieces. So the battle consisted of a very large hill at the top, which you can see, and water features at the bottom left corner. Now in other cases uh, a historical playing area requires me to create the full 3 by 4 foot playing area to map mimic the actual historical terrain. Now in both cases, whether or not I create individual pieces which I fit onto a standard terrain piece or create a whole 3 by 4 foot terrain piece, I end up with my storage facilities or garage filled with custom terrain which I only use a foot few times and then very rarely again. This works for games and gives you a nice playing area but probably is not that practical. Just as an example, this is the large hill that the SPI board game requires me to place. Now, um, it's felt bottom, so it stays firmly on my playing area, which happens to be flop, and I've had to make it into two parts in order to make it easier to store. Now, while it's possible I may use this for other games, it's actually unlikely, and I never have. So I, I think I've only ever used this for about four games, and three of them were playtests for the Marengo scenario. The other piece of custom terrain I needed to create was the water features in the bottom left of the playing area. Now this occupies the left flank of the attacker's player edge. Once you've added the other terrain, such as woods, built up areas and some hills, it actually looks rather good and is a joy to play on. But it's not really very useful for any other game which, does not, which is not a recreation of Marengo. Now with my Marengo playing area there is another issue and that is the edges. Placing terrain features on top of other features results in edges. Now um, I must admit this is not such a major issue when playing a game but it's another fact to consider and you need to limit the number of special terrain pieces unless of course they're hills otherwise you end up with a very messy playing area. Also I find the edges unless they're sufficiently um, gentle slope causes infantry elements to fall over quite often. Um, 
Now, these days I create a fairly gentle slope, but even a gentle slope is normally about 45 degrees, and things can still get quite uh, wonky when elements are placed on them in particular ways. Now, the next issue is storage. Um, in this particular case, I broke up this terrain piece into, or this terrain segment, into three separate pieces in order to make it easier to store, but it's still an issue to store. And once again, as with my large hill, once I've uh, completed a few games, uh, this will probably end up in my basement, uh, only to be seen again after archaeologists dig up, do a dig at my home in the far future. So while using custom-made terrain may look nice and gives you a very accurate playing area to reproduce your historical battle, a better solution is to use standard building block terrain, which is what I'll be covering now. First step is to look at uh, my standard terrain, or what kind of standard terrain can you create? Now, in my case, I normally use a 3 by 4 foot MDF tray, which has a standard road network built into it. This shows the short axis road network and the long axis road network. The X and S's are not embedded into the playing area and are simply shown, they're simply there to show where the objectives for victory conditions are placed. Players could create whatever road network they wished, or even bypass any road network and just have blank playing areas placing the road network on top of it. I use an embedded road network because it helps me position objectives and also identifies entry and exit points without any issues. Players can elect whatever solution suits them, but after a lot of testing I've found this road network seems to work in most cases. Now the other alternative is players could use flexible roads such as these pieces of felt. I, use, uh, I used to use felt roads many years ago when my playing area was felt in, in itself, but I found the roads creased and twisted and looked horrible so I stopped using them. I've discovered that my turf covered playing areas, that on my turf covered playing areas the felt stays firmly on the turf's, turf surface and all the bends and creases disappear. As you can see here, I may consider going back to a felt road system, but only if forced. Now even though my felt roads now stick very nicely on my turf covered playing area, almost like Gore-Tex, there is still the issue of the edges when you get close up. The embedded roads you can see here uses a house paint, which I've now replaced with a specific woodlands terrain road type paint, which looks a lot better than what you see here. But even so, I feel the embedded roads tend to look nicer, even in this example, than my felt road. In, most, uh, in the most part, roads are used to cross water features or to bypass other terrain. Thus, you may only need roads in those locations. Over a water feature, I use a bridge or forward terrain piece. And um, as for bypassing other terrain, I normally would, could use my trusty old felt roads for these short stretches. So if you really wanted to, you could avoid dealing with these, the whole road issue um, entirely when creating terrain. However, I must admit, I still generally like at least a minimal road network. Now we come to uh, water features or streams. My current system uses a standard stream terrain pieces which are placed on the standard playing area. The roads that you see here match up with the roads on the playing area and incidentally uses the woodland brown which I mentioned earlier and which looks a lot better than my soil house paint. This shows the stream playing pieces on my playing area. One point which I realised after I created them was it's, uh, it becomes a major issue matching them up with the roads on the playing area. If you spend enough time and effort, you can work out where they're supposed to go. But when you're setting up a game, you don't want to spend too much time solving a puzzle. Another reason why the felt stream system may actually be optimal. Unfortunately, I now consider the system that you see here a failure, and I pretty much never use these terrain pieces. Now, as with roads, the other option is I can use felt to represent my streams which on a turf-covered playing area sticks to the playing area as if glued. This is a good solution as it does give you maximum flexibility and I would recommend new players to focus on a felt-based terrain system as it's cheap and easy to, to make and use. However, even though I think it works reasonably well, the edges still annoy me. I will order some latex streams to see if that gives me a better solution, but in the meantime I can certainly live with this if required. 
One other solution I've been thinking of, apart from the latex system, is to use a rubber sealer to create my rivers. The US has a product called Flexi Paste, which when dry forms what looks like rubber. It comes in black and white. I could mix blue paint in with the white Flex Paste. As I do not live in the US, I will need to find a local equivalent. Another solution that I was told about to try was to use pool liner. But so far, uh, I've not found any uh, pool liner. It's not particularly common where I live, but I will continue to look. Now, one of my water feature terrain pieces, which I do occasionally use, is this, which is a corner river position and fits nice and snugly into my standard playing area without worrying too much about roads um, lining up. Um, this shows you how I use the corner piece. As long as you don't care about, um, you know, some of the roads covered, as you can see, one of the edges there are obscured. You can place this in pretty much any of the four corners in two different ways per corner, if you so desire. While my streams were absolutely a failure and I never used that, I do occasionally use this, but it's still comparatively limiting. And I only use this if I'm playing a points-based game, not a historical game. Well, streams and roads are pretty much the most difficult element of creating standard terrain. Uh, we'll now deal with something simple, and built-up areas are really simple. In my case, I use 4 centimeter square building blocks, which can be arranged in any manner you wish. In my case, felt is placed on the base, so it sticks to my playing area, and I top it off by placing a removable building on top of it. When troops occupy the built-up area, you simply remove the building, but the location of the built-up area remains static as your troops fight over it. The other two basic types of terrain pieces, area terrain, are also simply dealt with. For simplicity, for Napoleonics, I use a standard size of 6 cm by 10 or 12 cm for all area terrain pieces, such as hills, woods, lakes or swamps. For World War II Cold War, I'm using a standard size of 5 cm by 8 to 10 cm for all airy terrain, such as hills, woods, lakes or swamps. The standard sizes are based on element widths, and I do occasionally mix and match the terrain pieces, but generally I stay with the um, terrain pieces I've designed uh, for specific element width sizes. Now players can use any size they wish. Uh, this shows a 12 cm square woods that I created a long time ago. However, I tend to find the smaller size, that's 6 by 10 to 12, or 5 by 8 to 10 cm, gives me the greatest flexibility when attempting to recreate historical battles. Using these building blocks, I can now attempt to recreate a range of historical battlefields. Starting with my favourite battle, Marengo, this shows the position at about 7am with the Austrians only beginning their crossing of the major river and the French scattered around. The French, in this case, were totally surprised. This shows the same playing area around Marengo using my standard building blocks approaches. Um, the Austrians are on the right behind the red dotted line. The waterways are all felt, with the main river being light blue and the streams are darker blue. Uh, that's probably probably not the correct order, and the only reason why I use this light blue is because that's all I had at the present moment. I'll probably have to go out and get different colours to represent my rivers and stream. I've added a small road made from felt as well, which lines up with the default road network. This is in order to identify the river crossing. This is obviously not 100% accurate, but it gives me a playing area which resembles a Marengo battlefield closely enough to have a game and no custom terrain features were used. Using this system, I can reproduce pretty much every one of the 14 SPI playing areas, as well as a few new ones I'm creating covering other major battles. This works, and it seems to work reasonably well. Look, I can't say it's as good as custom terrain. The river edges don't look so good, and when there is fighting on a stream, the stream can be easily moved by accident. I'm really thinking long and hard about latex rivers or some other solution, and we'll probably purchase some just to test it out. But in the meantime, this works. Incidentally, the light blue colour, as I indicated, was a test. I used up all my other blue felt using doing something else. Um, I will need to think long and hard about the correct colours for rivers and streams. I suspect a dark blue for rivers and a slightly lighter, although not as light as this, for streams. While the felt does seem to stick on my um, flock-covered terrain, it still lifts, as you can say, see here. 
Your train does need to allow for the felt to stick to it, otherwise you may not be able to do the curves correctly. I found a felt topped playing area does not give you enough sticking power, but you can probably get by if required. This is another example of lifting felt. The felt will form curves well enough, but unless you iron the roads before you play, this kind of lifting will occur. I suspect I could carry a travel iron with me to the clubs I play in. However, if I bring it out, someone may think I'm a highly domesticated married man who was about to iron my t-shirt, and I would not wish that, would I? Wait a minute, I just need to make sure the toilet seat is down before I continue with this video. Let's look at another battle occurred in 1800, in this case the Battle of Hohenlinden. This shows the playing area. The French were at the top and the Austrians at the bottom. This shows the standard playing area for the same battle. From the perspective of the French player, which is the opposite of what you saw earlier, the Austrians enter from the top. Um, unfortunately, when I took this picture, I um, had the um, playing area around the wrong way, so it didn't match my earlier image. Um, but nonetheless, um, this playing area seems to represent the battle moderately well. There are some areas which are not 100% correct, but um, it still plays reasonably well. The victory conditions are one area I need to fine tune. The French, at the present moment, need to hold the three objective towns, uh, which they currently control on the left uh, under their blue line, and uh, their outflanking force is on the right. The Austrian main column is in the centre, and the other forward column is on the left. The Austrians have two corps trailing behind. This shows the situation about 9am in the morning from the perspective of the Austrians. As you can see, the main French line at the top right corner, the outflanking force at the top left corner, the two forward columns, you can see one in the centre of the Austrians and one on the extreme right, and of course the two trailing uh, corps down the bottom. Now, uh, this sheet here is my simplified deployment uh, sheet for the battle. This comes from my scenario PDF for my board game to figure game rules, but um, players can create their own um, scenario sheet and any you know using whatever particular rules they so desire. They just need to take the template and then just plug in the numbers accordingly. I uh, got this idea from another set of rules. I can't remember what it was, and it's actually quite good having a single sheet which allows you to deploy and also indicates all reinforcements as well as have the game turn marker on. Makes life a lot easier when you're playing a game. Well this shows the Battle of Auschwitz. Uh, the playing area is incredibly busy with lots of streams. The Russians attack down the right of the screen where it was met by French reinforcements uh, arriving off the right edge. So this is actually looking at it from the French side of the playing area or the battle. The uh, Napoleon launched his major offensive in the centre left of the screen. Personally, I think this is one of the worst maps of all the SPI games. I am really tempted to create my own map. Now, reversing the aspect of the playing area, this shows the standard terrain piece playing area from the aspect of the Allies. The hills running across give the Allies a strong position, but when they decided to attack the French on the left, they exposed themselves, and Napoleon, of course, took full advantage of this error. This shows the playing area from the aspect of the French. In this playing area, the roads really have no um, effect. I mean, it's not really used. Both sides are fairly close to each other. It's an interesting point about rules. So when you start a battle where both sides are pretty close to each other, roads really don't have much impact. Uh, when you start a battle where the sides are a great distance away from each other, roads become more significant. And of course, um, that really is dependent upon the rules that you use. This is again one of my scenario sheets for uh, Auschwitz, showing each player how they can deploy. I'll provide a link at the end uh, if people are interested in the scenario PDF, which provides a image of all the playing areas as well as this particular deployment sheet for each of the areas. Now, this is all based on the SPI board game. Uh, some of them I've created from real TONEs, but the vast bulk are basically SPI board game values, and as a result, you need to take the values with a big grain of salt, but at least it gives you a rough idea of where everyone starts before the game begins. 
This shows the deployment. Uh, again, the deployment is based on the SPI uh, board game, um, and it's the deployment before the French attack. Now, the uh, Allies are at the top. The white figures are Austrians, the greenish Russian, and of course the blue are French. Now we'll move to a rather more plain playing area or battle is Ilo. Now this, in this case, this is the template. The river is shown here, but it's frozen, so you don't really have to worry, worry about it. The main water feature is the town in the center, a few hills and probably some woods, which tend not to get used very much during the game. This shows the Eilau playing area using standard terrain pieces. The French are deployed on the left and the Russians on the right behind the red dotted line. That double um, built up area area is Eilau. This shows the deployment, surprisingly enough, from the same, from the, uh, same aspect as before. As you can see, the Allies get reinforcements at the top left corner and the French get their reinforcements from the bottom right center corner. This shows the deployment of both armies on the afternoon of the 7th with the main battle occurring on the 8th. In the SPI board game you start on the 7th and there's a bit of maneuvering and some minimal conflict up front with the main battle occurring after night has passed. Now we'll be moving to uh, Vagram, and this shows the template of the playing area. The number of roads here are quite uh, significant, and I normally don't use them all on the playing area, but, you know, players can do whatever they so uh, desire. Generally, I find that the important aspects of the roads are where they cross bridges and terrain features. In this particular playing area, it's mainly bridges. Uh, unfortunately, once again, we're reversing the aspect. Uh, when I created these photos, I didn't realize that um, I had the, the aspect incorrect, so my apologies. But anyway, this shows the playing area from the French side. The Austrian front line at the start of the battle is shown as a red dotted line. Historically, the Austrians advanced on their right, which is left on this screen, and pulled back on their left, which is right on this screen. Before launching their before launching their attack, uh, which happened to be about the same time the French intended to launch their attack, this is um, actually quite an interesting battle. I find this shows the deployment sheet for um, Vagram from the Austrian side. As you can see, the um, the stream and uh, which the Austrians used to great effect on their left flank. Um, and of course behind that you had, um, I think it was the Rusbach Heights or some, some sort of heights that the Austrians also used to defend. Historically, the French decided to launch um, their main attack on their right, which is left of this screen, uh, and the Austrians uh, launched their, well, their, they, they tried to launch a, uh, a broad-based attack, but their main thrust was on their right, which is right on this screen. Now this battle also spans two days, so what you see here is the French position when they had crossed the river and were moving into their attack position uh, and, the, and the Austrians began to react. Now uh, on the second day we had most of the action, so um, again because this is a board game reproducing an actual historical battle, uh, we're not uh, starting off the game with both forces looking at each other's eyeballs, uh, we're starting well before the battle, so each player can do a bit of their own positioning and manoeuvring. And I tend to enjoy that. Um, however, depending on the rules that you use, it may not be possible, and you may need to start this battle on the second day when both sides were actually facing at each other. Now let's move to uh, Borodino. What we can see here is my template for the playing area, and um, it's interesting here, the uh, SPI board game has a river which normally cannot be crossed without a bridge and yet they as a result have lots and lots of bridges or fords on it so I'm not quite sure why they made it a um, river. Anyway, the built up areas with a dot on it are the uh, fortified areas which the Russians have prepared and which most of the battles uh, were fought over. Uh, the bulk of the battle occurred in the lower half of this screen shows Borodino using my standard playing areas with the Russians on the left and the French on the right. The dotted line represents the Russian front line. Two of the built up areas are the artillery position. Um, I mean it's not marked here but um, 
you would normally place a figure in there that makes it clear that it's some sort of fortification. This shows in reverse aspect um, the deployment sheet, in this case the French are on the left um, and the Russians are on the right. This is the um, very detailed deployment sheet which I no longer use. One interesting thing about deployments, um, when I initially converted these board games, um, the SPI board game obviously exactly deploys every single unit and so I tried to duplicate that. Well, okay, maybe you could do this if you created a custom terrain piece, but if you're going to have a very a generic terrain piece, uh, that's probably not such a wise thing. So these days I just simply uh, identify a spot and say you can place your forces anywhere within a certain distance and behind a certain line, and that tends to work probably a lot easier and better than the old SPI um, deployment. But this shows you the SPI detailed deployment of both sides. Obviously the Russians on the right are green and the French are blue. Now I've uh, missed quite a few of the playing areas and I'm not going to go on to 1813, 1814 and 1815 which consists of a whole bunch of additional playing areas but I think you probably get the point. Now I have to admit uh, many of the playing areas using standard terrain pieces are not an exact representation of the playing area. But in most parts, they're close enough to give opposing player a feel for the actual battle. And so comes a close, my part 33 player idea video series, in this case how to recreate historical playing areas using standard terrain pieces. Alle guten Dingen kommen zu einem Ende.